we will still use uh, the same slide for a, a, a little more. Okay. Uh, but that's quite a trick to use the same slide because now I want to speak about the newer algorithms and in fact they are slightly different. So, uh, in fact, usually we don't use this exact commutative diagram when presenting the, uh, the algorithm. So the challenge today is to keep with the sli same slide but still do something different. Okay, so, well, so I'm going to draw my, the slide and uh, we are going to change a few things in it. And then we will we will move on. Okay. So. Okay. Mm, okay. So I want things to be familiar. So the first thing I have changed, I am going to change. Okay. So this should be fixed mm -hmm. compared to what we had before. And there are little change I want to do in the slide. So I'm going to do a little change in the slide. OK, so the change first, you know, before, uh, all the time I had the characteristic here, which was, uh, uh, which was a prime. So I, uh, everything was over the finite field fp, where p was a prime. And we went into the extension fp to the k. And now with the new algorithm, we are slightly changing the, the context. And we are going to consider here and there and there a finite field which is not necessarily a prime field. So it can already be an extension field. And at the bottom, we are going to have an extension of this extension. OK, it doesn't hurt that much, but it's something I, you need to know. Otherwise, you are going to get lost. So instead of having p everywhere, I'm going to have q. But q is going to be already some extension field. OK, so Q is going to be P to the sum C. OK? So it's a very tiny difference, but you, we will have it uh, a, lot, uh, a lot in this, uh, in this new algorithm. OK. So now I am still going to start from polynomials. Uh, and to keep things as simple as I can for you, I will still start from polynomial in two variables, x and y. And then I'm going to do some substitution to go here and some substitution to go there. <coughs> and the substitution I'm going, to go, I'm going to use to go here is going to be, instead of replacing y by f2 of x, well, I am still going to replace y by f2 of x, but I'm going to use a special polynomial. So remember yesterday, the polynomial I used when I did the replacement uh, was at the beginning general. And then we focused on the special case where, where y was a, a pure power of, of x. So now we are still going to replace y by a pure power of x. But we are going to choose something even more specific. We are going to use one very specific power of x that is very nice for us. So we are going to replace y by x to the q. Okay, on this side. And on the other side, what, what are we going on the other side? What are we going to do? Uh, well, first, before going to the other side, when I do this, the polynomial here is going to have a degree which is going to be quite large. In fact, compared to what we had before, before we had polynomial whose degree was relatively small. And now the polynomial here is going to have a, a large degree. That's a problem, because if you have a polynomial of large degree, and you use uh, confiler those pomerans for polynomial, it's going to tell you, well, the probability that, that this splits into term of, of low degree is low. So the algorithm is not going to be efficient. So here, well, we are still going to do it. But since we are going to do it, there is a big question mark here. Why is this going to work? So we are going to do something that should not work using the classical heuristic, but we are still going to do it. So we have a question mark here. Why is this going to, why is this going to work? It's still the same principle, but we are doing something strange. On the other side, we are going to do something even stranger compared to what we did before, instead of replacing x by something in y, we are again going to replace y by something in x. Okay? 
And so we will land, instead of going to f of y, we are going to go again to fq of x. Okay, so in fact, we are using y temporarily to, to keep the same diagram, but in truth, there are no y anywhere anymore when I'm doing, uh, when I am doing my, um, my relations. Okay, um, so what, what, is what are we going to use uh, as replacement for y? Well, we are going to use a polynomial in x, but that would be okay. So it would not disturb you too much, it would be okay. But to, give, to get some additional freedom, instead of replacing y by a polynomial in x, I am in fact going to replace y by a rational fraction in x. So this way I am going, I am going to have more choices. Okay, because there are just more coefficients. There are some coefficients on the numerator and some in the denominator. Okay? And then I have my question mark here, so something is going to happen here. But on this side, if these two things have, have low degree, we can expect that after the replacement, we will have something of low degree in the numerator. On the denominator, this is just going to be a power of H1. So something that, that we can easily add to the smoothness basis to the polynomial we, we take into account. So this is going to be quite fine. On this side, we can expect things to factor into small degree factors. And then we will get a relation between this large degree polynomial and this low degree one, which is going to factor. Okay, so the real big question, if we want things to work in there with the new algorithms is, well, why is there any chance that this can work? Okay, so this is the real uh, the real difficulty with the with the new algorithm. Okay. So to give you a little hint of why this might work, uh, I need more board today. Okay, so maybe I will use this one. So I'm going to write something which is extremely classical in finite fields, which is the following. So. Tell me if you are not familiar with this, uh, with this equation. I am going to write the polynomial x to the q minus x. Okay? So this is a very simple polynomial which comes from y minus x and I replace y by x to the, to the q. And I claim that this polynomial, despite the fact that it has quite a high degree, where q can be large, um, this is just that. Is this familiar to all of you, or does anyone want a proof? The proof is not complicated, so if you are not familiar with that, I can really give it. Okay. As Every one of you already seen this equation? No? Okay. So I'm going to convince you now. So uh, first thing I can do is I can write that x to the q minus x is clearly x times x to the q minus 1 minus 1. Okay, factoring x out is not very difficult. Okay. So this is on the other side, the product we have is, is just x times the product for alpha in fq star of x minus alpha. So the question is, is this polynomial equal to that one? That's the question. Okay? So remember, we are in a finite field. FQ is a finite field. So we are in a field. In a field, you know that a polynomial of degree D has at most D roots. Okay? It has at most D distinct roots. And now, uh, 
Well, this is the polynomial of degree Q minus 1. This is the polynomial of degree Q minus 1. Uh, the, these two polynomials have the same uh, head monomial, x to the Q minus 1. You just expand the product. So these two polynomials are equal if and only if they have the same roots. And here I have exactly Q minus 1 distinct root. So if any of these values is a root of this polynomial, I am winning. Okay, so there is equality between this polynomial if and only if. Okay, so this is okay. If and only if for all alpha in FQ star, alpha to the Q minus 1 is equal to 1. Okay? And is that true? Well, you know that this is a group, FQ star. It's a group with Q minus 1 element. You know that in every group, the order of the element divides the order of the group. So if you take any element and raise it to the power of the order of the group, you find one. And that's it. OK, so clearly, this is true. OK, so we have one special polynomial of high degree compared to what we had before. And this polynomial, despite having high degree, is factoring into low degree terms. OK? So this is quite interesting, but it's only a single polynomial. Okay, so now the question is, how are we going to have many polynomials possible here? OK? So that's, that's the question. And the next question is, uh, well, I have done this substitution, but is it meaningful to say that if I do these two substitution, I'm going to land into my finite field f of q to the k. Okay? So, well, if there is something like that, it means that in my finite field f of q to the k, there will be some equality x to the q equal h0. And is this possible? Well, yes, this is possible. You just choose random polynomial h0 and h1 until until what? Until, so I'm going to do the algebra online, until h1 of x times x to the q minus h0 as <coughs> an irreducible factor of degree k, as usual. OK? Um, as usual, if you take random polynomials, h1 and then h0, and you make sure that k is going to be, to be smaller than k plus degree of h1, otherwise, uh, than q plus degree of h1, otherwise nothing is possible, of course. But if you make sure that this polynomial has a large enough degree, uh, the probability for this to, to occur is roughly 1 over k, or 1 over k once again. Okay, so it's, it's clear that without any real difficulty, we can find two polynomial h0 and h1. We can't, we can't exactly prove it if you bound the degrees to be very small. But in practice, what is happening is that if you fix these two degrees to be at most two, for any finite field you, you can think of in practice, you just do the, the trial of the polynomial and you are going to find one. Okay, so it's very easy to make lists for anything you want. Okay, it's very, very, very quick and very, very easy. We can't prove that it is always going to work. So if you are a mathematician and don't like heuristics, this is the first heuristic in the algorithm. Uh, but if you, just, if you just want to check whether it works, for any case you can think of, it's going to work. Okay, so don't worry about this. Okay, so I'm going to start from polynomial up there. That's what I want to do. I'm going to do these two substitution. I'm going to end up there. But the thing I want to do is I want to select polynomial up there in such a way that here they will magically split into linear terms or into low degree terms, depending on, on what we are going to do. Okay, so I want to solve this big question mark. I already showed you one example of when you can do that, but we want many to be able to generate many relations. Okay? <coughs> so 
Now let's move forward in my slides because I have a few slides that I can show you. So all these you already saw the other day. So we are back in small characteristic and I'm going to present things in a slightly different way from what was on the board. Uh, just can't removing y. Okay, because in fact I told you this y I kept it to keep things familiar, but in fact you don't really need it. Okay, so <coughs> So the first thing you do is you define your finite field, as I told you, by a relation of this type. Okay? If you want, it's possible to use an alternate representation, but it makes things a little bit more complicated. It's, it's slightly more efficient in practice, but it makes things more complicated. So for today, I will really stick to this one. Yeah. Unless you strongly disagree, but I think it's okay. And then, I'm going to wait until I find these two polynomials such that this contains the irreducible factor of the degree k. Okay, and clearly, now if theta is the root of the irreducible factor, then you can define the finite field as being f q of theta. And I told you before, we have one systematic relation, this form. Okay. And we want to build more. Okay. So one thing you could do is recall the linear change of variable and try to use the linear change of variable to build more, more relations. Um, but it's clear that if you do that, you will never get enough. So we need a, a more efficient way to derive new relations from this one, to find new polynomials in X and Y that are going to split into low degree terms. So the basic idea is the following. What you do is you take this equation, x to the q minus x equals this. And this is a formal equation. It works whatever the value of x is. You can replace x by z, by, uh, by any, anything you want. And this is still going to hold. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this equation here, I am going to replace x by a rational fraction, a of theta over b of theta. So a polynomial, something in the finite field at the bottom, which is going to be represented by a rational fraction with a low degree numerator and a low degree denominator. OK? So let's do that. So I'm going to erase the board because it's too familiar, so you need something new. So I start from x to the q minus x equal product of x minus alpha. Okay, I'm starting from this product of a the finite field. And in this, I just replace a, I just replace x by a polynomial in theta. So this is going to be a of theta over b of theta the q minus a of theta over b of theta equal product of a theta minus b of theta minus a. Well, this is not very big. So now, of course, if there is a numerator, a denominator, it, it cannot be zero, otherwise wouldn't mean much. So I can multiply by it, and the equality will, will be still, uh, still nice and significant. And so I just multiply by a power of it. And which power? Well, I want to cancel out the denominator, because it's not good to work with rational fraction. We want polynomials. So I'm going to cancel out the denominator. So this is easy. And the next thing I want to do is, well, I will multiply by one extra b of theta factor. And you will see why, because things are going to be nicer and more symmetric. So, so that's why I'm going to, what I am going to do. So if you do that, you are going to obtain b of theta times a of theta to the power q minus a of theta times b of theta to the power q equal product of this.
and an extra factor d of theta. <coughs> there is one more. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. So now I have this polynomial of i degree of degree well of i degree because there is a, there is a q's power. So I have this polynomial of i i degree in theta, and it split into a product of low degree term because a and b are all of low degree. Okay, so it's exactly what we wanted. We, this is the mysterious question mark we had on, uh, on the left of the diagram. Okay. And now we are going to manipulate this a little bit more. And uh, to manipulate this, uh, the simplest case is to assume that A and B are polynomials with coefficient in FQ. Okay, this is not what you find in the early description of the algorithm. You find something else. You have polynomials with coefficient in a higher degree field. So it was only linear polynomial A and B, but the coefficient were in FQ square or in FQ cube, and it makes things a little bit more complicated to analyze. So today I'm going to assume that A and B are just low degree polynomial, okay, and, but their coefficient are in the small field FQ. If I do that, there is something magic happening. Uh, did, did all of you know the, the phrase linearity of Frobenius? So does this ring a bell for anyone? No? Okay. So linearity of Frobenius is something very stupid and very, very, very important. It's infinite field. Okay. Uh, in a finite field of cardinality Q, if you take two, two things, U and V, and raise it to the power Q, what do you find? Well, expand the binomial. So if you expand the binomial, you are going to find something crazy. You are going to find U to the Q plus a big sum of things plus V to the Q. And the big sum is for going from, to be from 1 to q minus 1. And there will be a binomial of i in q uh, times u to the q minus i, v to the i. OK? Well, this is a huge, big, and complicated formula. But when you look at this, remember, this is <coughs> And what I claim is that if Q is prime, okay, then Q divides this. So for prime field, it's clear what you are going to have to have is U to the P times plus V to the P. And it also works the same thing in, uh, in extension field. Okay, so what is going to happen is this is going to simplify to U to the Q plus V to the Q. And in fact, if you take any polynomial, and raise it to the power q. It's exactly the same thing if you take any polynomial with coefficient in fq. What is going to happen is that this is going to be equal to that. Okay? So this is the linearity of Frobenius. This is very, very nice and important. Okay? So you might, you might ask, how are we going to do that? Or why is it working? Well, you are going to, if this is a power of 2, you can easily check it by repeatedly squaring. Okay? When you square, you are going to have something simple. These terms are going to cancel out. And so if you square many times, you are going to have the same, uh, the same thing. Okay? Um, so this is very important. So now I can rewrite this to be B of theta times A of theta to the Q minus A of theta times B of theta to the Q. But now by definition of my finite field, theta to the Q is H0 of theta over H1 of theta. And this
And this is also H0 of theta times H1 of theta. So I have another rational fraction that pops out. But if you expand this fully, then the numerator of the rational fraction will be something of quite low degree. OK? <coughs> so let's, let's move in the slides, and we, we will see that we find something very similar. So what we are going to do is I'm, I'm claiming that if I, uh, uh, if I expand this, this rational fraction, the numerator is going to be H1. Well, I, I put back an unknown instead of the theta again, but it doesn't really matter. So I define this bracket of two polynomials A and B to be H1 of x to the power d times B of, B of x, A of H0 of, over H1 of x minus A of x times B of, of the same, of uh, the H0 over H1. So what I claim is if the maximum degree of A and B is d, then by doing that, I am canceling out the denominators. You can easily check that. Because the largest power of, of H1 coming into the denominator is, is at most d. So by multiplying by this, it's no longer a rational fraction. It's a polynomial. OK? And, uh, and this, OK. So this is my very nice polynomial. OK? So summing this up, if you take everything together, what you can do is you can rewrite all the stuff we have been doing here in the following way. You can write that Okay, so you might ask, well, there you, you are forgetting the extra b of theta, but it's inconvenient to have this extra b of theta. You know, you have a nice product which is written in a nice and elegant way, and then you add the parasitical factor. It's, it's a, you don't want to do that. Okay, so in order not to do that, I'm going to change what I put in my product. So remember, until, until now, my product was for alpha in FQ. Okay, um, but there was one extra term. So I'm going to say, okay, in fact, instead of doing that, I'm going to do the product for alpha in the projective line of FQ. So I'm going to take the same thing, but add one point at infinity. And I'm going to decide by, by convention that A of alpha minus point, minus infinity times B of, of alpha is just going to be by convention in this B of, B of theta. Okay? It might seem strange, but it makes the notation more compact. And in <laughs> fact, uh, geometrically, there is a real meaning there. So, so it's nice to do it. Okay, so we have this very nice simplified equation. So this is a product of low degree polynomial. Okay, even if you just assume that this is. Uh, Notation shortcut. This is a product of low degree polynomial. This is just some fixed polynomial. I can always add it to, to, my, uh, to my smoothness basis. And anyway, the degree is low, so it's, it's OK to the power d. And this is a polynomial of degree quite small. What is the maximum degree of this? Well, it's clear the degree of this, th this part has degree, degree of b plus degree of a times degree of h0. OK, but well, there is an h1. So if you really analyze the things, you, what you are going to have here for this part after multiplication, it's degree of b plus degree of a times maximum of the two degrees of h0 and h1. OK, on the, on the other side, you have something symmetric. So the maximum, so you, you have a, a bound on the degree of this which is just the maximum of the degree of A and B, D, factor the maximum of the degree of H0 and H1. We call that, that big H plus 1. OK? And remember, I told you earlier, in practice, you can essentially always take H to be 2. 
So it means that the degree of this is going to be at most three times the degree of A and B. Okay? And factoring a polynomial of degree 3D into terms of degree D, the probability that this event happened. Okay, it's something complicated if you, you remember confidence Erdos Pomerans, but what I claim is that it is going to be lower bounded by some constant. Okay, so if you take one choice of A and B with some constant probability, you will get one relation. So this is really magic. Before we had some very low probability of obtaining uh, relations, and now we just have a constant probability. So if you, if you need a big, uh, big number of relations, you just explore, you just explore the, uh, a set of polynomials, which is the number of relations multiplied by some constant, and you are done. So finding relation is going to be extremely fast. What is going to be costly is doing the linear algebra. We are no longer going to balance the two phase because one of them is so efficient that there is no point in trying to, to make it worse anyway it won't help the second phase. Okay? So basically this is, uh, this is the main idea of all the recent development. Okay? We have just changed the way we product the relations and we are just using these new things to have something which is systematically a product of low degree polynomial on one side and which is of very low degree on the other, so magically everything happens. Okay? So to explore this in more details, we need to look at a little bit more, we, we need to look a little bit more at the properties of the bracket and the choice of D we are going to take and this kind of thing. But it's okay. So Okay, so I have the, here the same equation as on the board, except that the left and right side are permuted. So I always do that. So whenever I speak about left and right, it's a problem. And, uh, yeah. It's even worse because yeah, as usual, I usually mix up the two sides. So, uh, well, in my head, I never know where, what is left and what is right. So, he, okay, so if I tell you something strange about left and right, just ask me. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I just told you the degree is not too big. It is this. So just say it again. Um, the relation between polynomial of degree D can be found easy. So remember, if you are doing index calculus, if you decide that your set of specific small elements is going to be the set of all polynomials in theta with coefficient in FQ on degree at most D, okay. Uh, well, then you just need to find a number of relations which is bigger than the number of polynomials, roughly q to the d. Well, the number of unitary polynomials of degree d is q to the d. Okay, and then you only keep the irreducible one, so, so the number of polynomials in your smoothness basis is smaller than that. Okay, so you need at most q to the d relations. Okay? So the cost of the linear algebra is going to be what? So the dimension of the matrix, so I, when I'm writing my matrix of relations, so these are my, I take logs, so I get linear equations, and so I'm going to get a big matrix of dimension Q to the D. So how much does it cost to do the linear algebra? Does anyone remember from the previous days? Okay. Exactly. So I told you the other, the other, during the previous days, it's roughly the square. But for, in the previous day, the matrix was extremely, was extremely sparse. Okay. Um, now it's a little less sparse because when you look at these relations, on this side there are just a few, a few polynomials, so it's okay. But on this side there are many polynomials. There are q plus one, <coughs> so the number of of entries in each line is q plus some constant. 
So when Q is large, it's, it's essentially Q. So instead of costing Q to the 2D, the linear algebra now is going to cost Q to the 2D plus 1. OK? Because there are Q on 3 pair, like what, Q plus uh, 7, but we don't care. OK, so the linear algebra is going to cost a little bit more than before. But it's still OK. And now one thing is that if you can choose a fixed degree D, so we are going to check in the next slide that we can choose some fixed value for D. But if you can choose a fixed value for, for D, writing down the equation is costing Q to the D. Solving the system is costing Q to the 2D plus 1. But if you can fix D, this is polynomial in Q. And the degree of the extension we have, remember, it's a, an irreducible that divides uh, some things times x to the q. Well, it's something of degree k. But k is close. What you can do is having k close to q. OK? So to compute all these logs of small polynomial in, the fin in a finite field of size uh, essentially q to the q, Okay, it's Q to the power of something close to Q. It's costing you Q to a constant. Okay. Well, it means that, in fact, the running time to do that is polynomial in the log of this. Because when you take the log of this, you see it's Q time log Q. <coughs> and Q time log Q. Uh, if you get a complexity, Q to the power something, well, it's clearly polynomial. Okay. So you might tell me, yeah, well, you are forgetting some polynomial, some logarithmic factors, maybe, because the numbers are huge when you do the linear algebra. And I didn't speak about the size of the numbers. Yes, that's true, but it's not going to change the fact that this is going to be polynomial with the size of the finite field. Okay, so... Computing the log of these elements in the smoothness basis now, we suddenly went down from something which costed a lot, which was uh, sub-exponential, L of one third, and it just dropped down to something which is polynomial. Okay? Just by using the fact that this magically factor. OK? And basically, that's it. So of course, we need to be able to compute individual logarithms. But this is going to be a very different story, even more complicated than the classical descent we, we saw yesterday. So I'm not going to go into all the detail. I'm just give, going to give you a few, a few hints about that. But the basic idea and the basic complexity analysis is just that. OK, so now let's try to see whether we can take a fixed value for D. OK, so well, first thing I claim, if there are people doing pairing here, I have something which is bilinear. So it's really nice. OK, so what, why, why is this bilinear? Well, it's just, just very easy. When you look at, uh, at the formula that defines the bracket, so where is it? When you look at the formula that defines the bracket, uh, take the bracket with the polynomial A1 and the polynomial A2, and take the sum of the two brackets. OK, clearly you can reorganize the term to have an A1 plus A2 here and an A1 plus A2 here. It's very clear. OK, so and same thing on the side, side of B. And if you multiply A by any constant, you are just multiplying by the constant here and there, so it's, it's clear. You have bilinearity. Okay? If, you, it, if you take a bracket with a sum, it's the sum of the bracket. If you take a bracket with a product by a constant, it's just the constant times the bracket. So this is linear on the left, and by symmetry, it's also linear on the, on the right. Okay? So it's clearly bilinear. You can't use it to do crypto and pairings because it's 
there is no arc problem related to this. So it's not bilinear in the exponent, it's just plain bilinear in the, with the numbers. Okay. What I claim also is that the bracket, bracket of A and A is zero. Well, just look at the symmetry of the definition. If you have A here and A here, the two terms are equal. So something minus itself is probably zero. So the bracket of A and A is zero. OK. So now what we can do in all the equations, we can always assume that the, that the polynomial harmonic, so that the head coefficient is what? Because if it's not, you just factor it out on the left and the right and just get rid of it. Okay, so you don't care about head coefficient. You can assume that A and B are not. And now, by bilinearity, you can, by the two property of bilinearity and the fact that the bracket of A and itself is zero, you can easily check that the bracket of A and B is equal to the bracket of A on B minus A. Just use bilinearity to expand. It's going to be the bracket of A on B minus the bracket of A on A, which is zero. So this is true. But if A on B have the same degree D, and you do that, and they are both monic, and you do that, the degree of this is going to fall. So without loss of generality, we can always assume that the degree of B is strictly smaller than the degree of A. OK? So this helps us to know exactly what kind of relation we can, we can, uh, we can look at. And in fact, uh, the, the overwhelming fraction of relation is going to come from this choice. Take degree of A to be D, degree of B to be D minus 1. And then by bilinearity, you can, uh, you can assume that this is monic again. And you can reduce the coefficient of A of degree D. In A, you can re reduce the coefficient of X to the D minus 1 to 0 by subtracting an adequate multiple of B in the same way that we did before. So it means that we can essentially count the number of relations we can uh, obtain by enumerating polynomials of this form. We are going to take all the relations we can obtain by considering that A is the polynomial, is the polynomial of the form x to the d plus something of the degree d minus 2, and B is going to be x to the d minus 1 plus something of the degree d minus 2. Okay, and if you do that, you are really going to obtain distinct relations. If you don't take care and just take random polynomials A and B, you may see several times the same relation due to all these properties I have just shown you. If you don't take, take care, you are going to take the, see the same thing many times. But if you, if you use this, you are going to see different relations. So it's going to be very nice. OK. Um, so now, let's look at the value of D we can take. So first try, which is clearly bad. Let's take degree 0 everywhere. Well, if you take degree 0, then A and B can, can only be constant. I told, the, I to, told you, you they can be unitary, so uh, harmonic. So A and B are going to be 1. And the bracket of A and B is just going to be 0. So this is plain and interesting. You are not learning anything. If the degree of, of D is 1, if, if big D is 1, according to what I, the analysis on the previous slide, the only choice I have is taking a equal x and b equal 1. If I do that, I get a single relation. Clearly, it's not going to be enough to compute the log of all polynomials of degree 1 because they are actually So this is not good. This is not going to work. OK. If you take degree 2, then apparently what you can do, well, what you can do is consider for A all the polynomials of the form x squared plus constant, for B all the polynomials of the form x plus constant, you have Q square candidates. Okay, you look at the bracket. It's something of degree. Uh, well, if you look precisely, uh, it's something of degree at most at most six, but in fact it's going to be slightly lower because because of what we have there. But well, you have only Q square candidates. 
you need Qs. You know that the size of the of the smoothness basis, which is going to contain all polynomials of degree two, also we, we choose D as a single parameter for the degree and A and B of A and B and the degree of the smoothness basis. So we are also going to have Q square of we are going to have Q square over two elements in the smoothness basis. So this is going to be good only if we can twist things in such a way that the probability is going to be a very nice constant, bigger than one half. Um, well, at first glance, it doesn't seem really good. So I will come back to that later. But if you just do it that way, it doesn't seem very convincing. Okay. So let's now go to D to the 3. OK, you know that you, so here there is a bug. It's a Q to the 4 candidate, because there are 1, 2, 3, 4 coefficient. OK, so you can generate many candidates then check the smoothness, and, which is constant. So you are going to get something of the order of q to the 4 over constant relation. I don't know what the constant is, but maybe it's 1 over 10 or 1 over 20 or whatever. And how many relations do you need? As many as there are irreducible polynomials of degree 3, essentially, because this is the biggest part of my year. And the number of polynomials of degree 3 is q of q cubed cubed over 3. So I have q4 over something relations and q3 over something unknown. That's enough. We can stop at d equals 3. OK? And when you do that, you get the same complexity that everything people had before. Uh, well, if they took care, at least, in, with the more complicated algorithm, which is d equals 3. So the complexity of doing the first phase is q to the 7. Okay? So it's polynomial, but the degree is quite large. Okay. So now we keep this q to the 7 in mind, and we are going to look at the practical consequences of that. Okay? I will stop doing theory for, for a little and look at the practical consequences. So, what are the best? Well, the more interesting uh, finite field of small characteristics for cryptographers. Any hint? Nobody wants to suggest anything? So if you, if you want to do crypto in a finite field and don't want to have big numbers, which finite field are you going to use? At least assume that you are five years ago. So. <laughs> Well, yeah. what people were using was f of two, 2 to the k. People were using finite field of uh, characteristic 2. That was uh, the choice. OK? And, OK, many people were careful and said, OK, we want to do that, but we don't want any, any special degeneracy or anything. So we are going to consider a finite field of the form 2 to the p, where p is prime. OK, because are, if you do that, there are no subfield, no, no strange things that are happening. So it should be the best choice. OK, and even in the current context, this is still the best choice. So with the new algorithm I have here, assume that you want to compute logs in this finite field, gf of 2 to the p. Can you do it directly? <coughs> well, not. No, you can't. Because if you try to do it with q equal 2, well, and h1 and h2 having the uh, on h0 and h1 having degree 2, the highest extension degree you can hope for is 4. Well, computing uh, discrete logs in gf of 2 to the 4, I think a generic algorithm is going to be. You can even use exhaustive search. Okay, so uh, okay, so it's not going to to work. So we want to make two larger. OK, this is a strange way of saying things, but uh, it reminds me of a crazy quotation. Nothing to do with that, but <coughs> do you know that an hexagon is a circle for any large enough value of 6? <laughs> so we want to make two larger. 
So how are we going to do that? Well, we are going to embed the finite field f of q to the p into the finite field f of q to the p for q being some power of 2. Okay, and clearly if we can compute log in this field, we can compute log in that one. Okay? So which value of q do we need? Well, let's just take L to be log P rounded up. And then it's going to be large enough for our purpose. Because 2 to the L is going to be bigger than P, so by doing the trick we had previously, uh, we are going to have a polynomial H0 over H1 times X to the Q, which is going to be bigger than P, the degree is going to be bigger than P, so we can hope for an irreducible factor of degree P and everything is going to be fine. So we are going to embed the finite field into this one. Okay? So if you are a cryptographer about five years ago and you don't care too much about security, you just want things to be barely safe, uh, you are going to take a prime close to 1000, a 10 bit prime. So it means that Q is going to be 1024. So now what is going to be the complexity of the initial phase? How much is it going to cost for me to compute the log of all polynomials of degree at most 3 in over this finite field? Uh, f of 1024, the log of this polynomial in the big field. q to the 7. So q to the 7 is going to be 2 to the 70. Well, okay, I know cryptographers are always saying anything smaller than 2 to the 80 is easy. Uh, but when you want to do it, well, 2 to the 70 is a lot. Doing what? Well, doing linear algebra on such a big thing with an estimated cost of 2 to the 70 operation and numbers of, of at least 1,000 bit. If you just compute the log modulo this, if you go there, it will be 10,000 bit or whatever. You don't want to do that. Okay? So two to the seven, Q to the 7 is too much. Hmm. And that's why many people are saying, okay, well, some people are saying, okay, these algorithms are theoretical because uh, we, nobody has ever done any extension 2 to the p with a reasonable value of p. And of course, and if you remember, the, record, the current record for uh, a 2 to the p is 2 to the 809. And it has been done uh, this year by, by people from Nancy, but using the old algorithm, the old function synthesis algorithm. Okay, so with the recent algorithm, this would cost too much. So what can we do? There is not much to do. The only thing you can do if you want to make things better is to try to lower d and have d equal to. Okay, because if you add d equal to, well, you would have a 5 here. This would be 2 to the 50. Um, okay, 2 to, 2 to the 50, we can probably do it. Okay? But I just told you, well, it's not really possible because, because of all these things. But in fact, I was lying. Okay? If you do things correctly, you can take d equal to. Okay. And I'm just going to show you. It's very easy if you want to look at d equal 2 because everything is generated by these brackets which are bilinear and anti-symmetric. So the only thing you need to do with d equal 2 is try to compute what is the bracket of x squared on the y, what is the bracket of x on y, and what is the bracket of x squared 
on x. Well, this doesn't feel very complicated. These are just stupid polynomials, so we should be able to compute that. Okay, so we are just going to do that to, to show you that these, uh, these things are not that mysterious. And uh, once we will have done that, uh, we, will be, we will be quite fine. Okay, so let's take x. Well, let, let's start by the easiest one. So x1 of this bracket. So what is it? If I remember correctly my formulas, it's going to be h1 of x squared time uh, did I substitute it in A or in B on the okay up to sign okay up to sign I'm once again mixing left and right so it doesn't really matter it's going to be this times 1 okay minus minus x <coughs> times when you substitute something in one it's still one okay so this is going to be h1 of x times h0 of x minus h1 of x times x okay this is my first break is that fine okay second one So this is still going to be h1 squared, h1 of x over h squared times x minus h. Okay. So this is going to be. Uh, this is going to be, let's expand everything, h0 squared, h0, that is a, okay, you can factor out, out x time h0 of x, um, after expanding the inner bracket, you find h0 of x minus h1 of x times x. Okay, and now let's do the final one. Sorry for the boring computation, but it's quite important. So. <coughs> okay, and this is H0 of X plus H1 of X times X factor H0 of X minus h y of x times x. Does everyone, everyone agree with that? Okay, you just factor, you find a square minus a square, you, and you refactor it. So what is extremely nice here is that this factor appears everywhere. So there is some constant factor that is always there. So, okay, I don't know what the degree of this thing is. Well, probably it's three. But it's a single polynomial. It's always there. So I'm just adding this single polynomial to my smoothness basis. And I am factoring out. It's going to appear in every relation, but it doesn't really matter. And let's look at the degree of the reminder. Okay, what is the degree of the reminder? Well, this is 2, this is 3, this is 3. Okay. And so now, what is the probability that a polynomial of degree at most 3 factors into terms of degree at most 2? 
Well, I claim that a polynomial at most 3 always factors into, into polynomial of degree at most 2 unless it is irreducible. Well, not very mysterious. And if you say that, well, what is the probability for a polynomial to be irreducible, a polynomial of, of degree 3? I told you yesterday, it's essentially one third. So the probability that it factors is two thirds. And how many relations do I need? One half. Two thirds is bigger than one half. Magic. I can take the equal to. OK? Well, I am hiding a few things under the ray. Uh, because if I just do that, I'm going to compute for a cost of q to the 5 the log of all polynomial of the grad mode at most 2. That's very fine, very nice. So it will cost 2 to the 50. But, and there is a big but, uh, if you take an arbitrary polynomial and try to move it down and down and down to degree 2, you will not be able to. You will be able to move down and down and down and down to degree 4 without any trouble. But then, going to degree 4, for, from degree 4 to degree 3, you will succeed with probability of close to 1 half. So, well, you will be missing a few polynomials, but let's forget about that. It was already in the previous, uh, in the previous algorithm, and I hid it, but doesn't matter. Um, and then you need to go from 3 down to 2. And there, you will just not be able to do it. Only a tiny, tiny fraction of polynomial of degree 3 will be computable that way. So what you need to do, you first do that. And then you use some magic I am not going to, to present. And the magic is, is going to be the following. You are going to say, OK, I have many polynomial of degree 3. And I want the log of all of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a nice way to split this polynomial into groups. So there are many polynomials of degree 3. They are q cubed. I'm going to split them into q group of size q, q squared, essentially. And then I'm going to find a way to write relation involving many po of the same kind as before, but only within a single group. If you can do that and find a relation that will relate logs of polynomial into one group to polynomial of degree 2, whose logs are already known, you will, by linear algebra, find the log of this group. Okay? And since the group contains only q to the squared, q squared polynomial, uh, polynomials, it is going to cost for one group q5 again. But since there are q groups, in fact, you are going to q6. OK? So if you want the full analysis of that, because it's really tricky to make the group, and you need some additional assumption on h0 and h1, which seems to be perfectly uh, satisfiable in practice, but I'm not going to, to show them now. So uh, you, you need a little bit more. But you can go down from Q7 to Q6. Okay. And what is very important is that you, you can do that for arbitrary extension degree. If you look at the early records for all this, this newer method, uh, all the early records when, were in specific extension. Almost all the big records are in Kummer extensions. So you know the special kinds of extension I presented the other day. Or in something slightly different, which is called a twisted Kummer extension, which is in fact a Kummer extension of a, over an extension of degree 2, but you can see it into well. Never mind. But these are special extensions. Why can we do Kummer extension better than the others? Well, for one very nice reason is if you want to target a Kummer or twisted Kummer extension, you can take the, for these two polynomials, you can take polynomials of degree 1. So all the degrees of the brackets are going to be smaller, and everything is going to be nicer. And that's why people computed a lot of records with Kummer extensions. Because it corresponds to lower degree here, so lower degree in relation, and everything is better. 
Okay, and moreover, there is this action of Frobenius I presented the other day, which reduces the size of the, of the, of the factor base by a, by a good factor of Q. Uh, and this is going, going to be very, very useful in practice. Okay? So this is quite, in, quite important. And uh, so if you want a full analysis, uh, there will be a paper at Ajax Red this year. Okay, and we will probably put a copy online quite soon. But the, the basic idea is coming from this analysis here. The fact that you can do the polynomial of degree 2 by themselves without directly targeting the polynomial of degree 3. Okay? Uh, how much time left do I have? Minus 10 minutes or something? Yeah. yeah. So, so I will not go into the, into the descent, the descent uh, phase. Just in order to do the descent, <coughs> so to compute individual logarithms, you need to use much more than what we did the other way. Okay? So you need to, in practice, you want continued fractions because that's very nice. Uh, then you, you want to have the classical descent. So, and using the classical descent in this context is a bit tricky. So I won't go into the detail, but it's tricky. And it's only, it only works if Q is already a power of something. But I will, you, you need a Y, and there is no Y, so you need to re-add Y. And if you just define Y to be X to the Q, it's not good enough. Okay? So you, essentially what you do, if you are computing uh, logs in over where Q is 2 to the 9, for example, you are going to, to consider Y to be X to the power 2 to the 5, or something like this. <coughs> so you are going to, come to take intermediate powers. And you can't do it if there are no subfields, so if, if, the, if it's not an extension field. So it's very, very specific. And then you can use something magic which, which is a bilinear descent. So now instead of doing linear algebra to do the descent, you need to solve systems of equation, which is much more costly in practice, but gives a better complexity. This gives complexity L of one force. And then you can add something uh, utterly inefficient in practice, which gives quasi-polynomial time complexity in theory. Okay? Um, that's probably the end of my lecture.